In this video, I'll introduce the financial system. The financial system plays a vitally important role in the health of the macroeconomy. A country's financial system is composed of banks, the bond market, and the stock market. The Great Recession of 2007 to 2008 was a global recession that began in the U.S. as a result of a collapse of the financial system. In particular, the crash of the housing market and the collapse of the financial system were caused by massive deregulation of banks and by pernicious mortgage lending incentives created by the U.S. federal government in the decade leading up to 2007. It was these events, along with an uncontrolled level of government debt, that led to the Greek government debt crisis of 2009 to 2019. In this lecture, we will take an in-depth look at financial systems. Before examining monetary policy in the Federal Reserve, we will attempt to achieve a foundational understanding of credit, banking, lending, borrowing, saving, and investment. Let's begin by examining the role of money in an economy. Money is anything that is accepted in exchange for goods and services or for the payment of debt. Historically, many societies have used commodity money in the form of coins made from gold, silver, or other precious metals or stones. On the Pacific island of Yap, the inhabitants make purchases by exchanging ownership of large circular stones, called ray stones. In the prisoner of war camps of World War II, prisoners exchanged cigarettes for goods and services. These are all examples of commodity money, because the money used for transactions had intrinsic value. That is, the money was valued not just for its use in trades, but for value derived from other uses as well. Commodities must meet several criteria to be effectively used as money. Its value must be easily determined, it must be divisible, and it must be durable. Ideally, money should also be easily standardized, and it should be portable. In the 21st century, our money is almost completely digital. Oftentimes, we don't even see our money. Instead, amounts are digitally transferred between banks, firms, and individuals. Moreover, the money that we use today has no intrinsic value. This type of money is called fiat money. Fiat money has little to no value beyond its value as an accepted means of facilitating trade. In fact, the only reason that fiat money can be used to buy goods and services or be used to pay debts is because the government has declared it legal tender. It is the power of the government and the faith of individuals in society that gives our dollar any value at all. Money has three primary functions in our economic system. First, money serves as a medium of exchange. In primitive economies, individuals must produce all of the things they need to survive on their own, much like animals in nature. However, unlike animals in nature, humans learned to exchange goods and services directly with one another through bartering. Efficiency in bartering requires a double coincidence of wants. In other words, you have exactly what I want, and I have exactly what you want. It is far more difficult to achieve a double coincidence of wants in more complex economies. This problem is solved when money is used to facilitate trades. We are no longer required to have exactly what the other person desires. Instead, I can sell to you in exchange for money that I can then use to purchase other goods and services. Money also serves as a unit of account. Because everything has a price expressed in some amount of currency, Money provides a standardized method for measuring and comparing relative values of a wide variety of goods and services. Lastly, money serves as a store of value. This is the function that enables people to save the money that they earn today and use it to buy goods and services at some point in the future. Other commodities besides physical or digital currency can serve as a store of value as well. For example, stocks, bonds, real estate, art, jewelry, or other valuables are assets that can be converted to money and used to pay debts or purchase other items. But this depends on how liquid an asset is. An asset's liquidity determines how quickly, easily, and reliably an asset can be converted into cash. How much money is in the U.S. economy? The Federal Reserve is tasked with measuring and reporting our money supply. The Fed developed several different measurements of the money supply, indicated as M0, M1, M2, M3, and others. M0 equals the total sum of Federal Reserve notes, i.e. physical dollars, plus all U.S. notes, plus all coins in circulation. Federal Reserve bank notes are currently used in the United States. If you have a dollar bill on your person and you examine it, you'll see the words Federal Reserve note at the top above the picture of George Washington. U.S. notes, or greenbacks, 
were printed by the U.S. Treasury and issued up until 1971. Although there are few U.S. notes still in circulation, they remain a valid form of currency in the United States. M1 equals the total amount in M0, plus all total checkable deposits. M2 equals M0 plus M1 plus total savings deposits plus money market deposit accounts plus small denomination time deposits plus shares in retail money market mutual funds. M2 is a broader definition of money and includes near monies. Near monies refers to monies that cannot be withdrawn instantly but are nonetheless accessible. Certificates of deposits, or CDs, and other small denomination time deposits can usually be cashed in at any time, but carry penalties for early liquidation. M3 equals M2 plus large and long-term deposits. M3 is a measurement of the money supply that is no longer produced by the Federal Reserve, but is still produced by various private institutions. Here are a few more definitions. A money market deposit account, or MMDA, is a high-yield savings account, regarded as an extremely safe, short-term investment with a higher interest rate than a typical savings account. An MMDA typically requires a higher initial deposit, a minimum balance with penalties if the balance falls below the required minimum, and banks and credit unions typically charge maintenance fees for the account. Besides fees and maintaining a minimum balance, MMDAs also limit the number of transactions. Money market mutual funds are a highly liquid type of fixed income mutual fund that invest in debt securities characterized by short maturities and minimal credit risk. Primary types of instruments held in mutual funds include treasury securities and U.S. government securities. A certificate of deposit, or CD, is a time deposit, a financial product commonly sold by banks and credit unions. The depositor agrees to leave a lump sum deposit untouched for a predetermined amount of time. However, the deposit earns a higher interest rate compared to savings accounts and money market products, and there are penalties for early withdrawal. In recent years, significant attention has been placed on cryptocurrency. Currently, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are stored in digital wallets, with the most secure wallets stored offline on hardware to prevent hacking. Designed as a medium of exchange, cryptocurrency is not yet widely accepted as payment for everyday transactions. Today, cryptocurrencies are used primarily for speculative purposes, as investors predict whether cryptocurrencies will be legitimized by governments and whether their use as a medium of exchange expands. Let's turn our attention now to the market for loanable funds, a financial market for saving and investment. As an initial simplifying assumption, we will assume that savers deal directly with investors. Financial intermediaries, such as banks, mutual funds, and other financial institutions, will be included later to describe the benefits of a well-functioning financial system. The market for loanable funds graph has the quantity of loanable funds on the x-axis and the real interest rate as a percentage on the y-axis. The supply of loanable funds is positively related to the interest rate, since savers will supply larger amounts of loanable funds at higher interest rates. The demand for loanable funds is negatively related to the interest rate since borrowers will borrow less money at higher interest rates and will borrow more money at lower interest rates. The demand curve represents the amount that individuals want to borrow at various interest rates. This includes people who want to purchase goods and services with borrowed money. For example, students taking out loans for college, consumers borrowing to buy a car, or entrepreneurs borrowing funds to start or expand a business. Firms are borrowers too. Firms borrow so that they can invest in new plants or new equipment, expand facilities, engage in R&D, and develop new products. Not surprisingly, the loanable funds market behaves similarly to a competitive market for goods and services. In actuality, financial markets are typically more competitive than most markets and reach equilibrium more quickly when events cause changes in the market. Now let's look at the determinants of the supply of loanable funds. The first determinant is economic outlook. When households' expectations about the future of the economy worsen, they save more. When households' expectations improve, they save less. Another determinant are the incentives to save. Governments and companies offer various incentives to individuals to encourage saving, such as retirement contribution plans like a 401k and other tax incentives. Another is income or asset prices. As incomes rise, people save larger proportions of their incomes. Asset prices work in the opposite direction. 
as home values appreciate and stock values increase, people feel wealthier and spend more and save less. Government deficits and surpluses have an impact on the supply curve as well. The supply of loanable funds includes both private and public saving. When governments engage in deficit spending, individuals and institutions buy up government bonds using their savings. This decreases the supply of loanable funds. When governments run budget surpluses, this increases the supply of loanable funds as governments buy back bonds and the general public now has more money to save. Now let's look at the determinants of the demand for loanable funds. The first being investment tax incentives. Investment tax credits effectively reduce tax payments for firms building new factories or buying new equipment. Such policies increase the after-tax rate of return on capital, which encourages businesses to borrow, and this is illustrated graphically as a rightward shift in the demand for loanable funds. New technologies increase productivity and provide businesses with an incentive to increase production, and this increases the demand for loanable funds. Increased government regulations make production more costly for firms. When governments impose more regulations on businesses, businesses reduce their demand for loanable funds because the return on business investment is reduced. When the demand for goods and services increase in an economy, this causes the price level to rise. Firms are incentivized to increase productivity and thus their demand for loanable funds increases. And finally, when firms' sentiments about the economy rise, firms tend to increase their investment demand, and so the demand for loanable funds increases. When firms' sentiments fall, investment demand decreases, and so does the demand for loanable funds. Instead of savers and borrowers interacting directly, savers and borrowers interact through a bridge a complex set of financial institutions like banks, bond markets, and stock markets called financial intermediaries. These financial firms, or intermediaries, acquire funds from savers and then lend these funds to borrowers, consumers, firms, and governments. Broadly speaking, the entire network of economic agents and the allocation of financial capital in an economy is referred to as the financial system. Financial institutions fulfill three important roles that facilitate the flow of funds to the economy. They reduce information costs, reduce transaction costs, and spread risk by diversifying assets. Financial institutions screen and evaluate the credit of potential borrowers, provide standardized financial products or instruments, and pool funds from many savers and lend to many borrowers. Savers have many different options when it comes to where to put their money. The primary difference among the many types of financial assets available is the return on investment, or ROI. Return on investment is the earnings, such as interest or capital gains, that a saver receives for making funds available to others. It is calculated as earnings divided by the amount invested. There is an inverse relationship between ROI and liquidity and safety. Potential earnings are higher for financial assets with low liquidity and high risk, whereas potential earnings are much lower for safer financial assets with high liquidity. This is the trade-off between lower risk and higher returns, and vice versa. Savers can invest directly in businesses by purchasing a bond or shares of stock from a firm using one of many brokerage firms. Or, savers can invest indirectly in businesses by providing funds to a bank or mutual fund that channels those funds to borrowers. Now let's talk about bond prices and interest rates. Most loanable funds are in the form of bonds. A bond is a form of debt used to fund a business, whereas a government bond is a form of debt used to fund government spending. Bond contracts include the following. A coupon rate, that is a fixed interest rate of the bond. A maturity date, that is the final payment date. And a face value, the value of the bond at maturity. Bond prices fluctuate in response to forces of the market. Bond prices and interest rates move in opposite directions. To see why bond prices and interest rates are inversely related, we need to analyze bond contracts more closely. As an example, suppose that company ABC issues a bond with a face value of $1,000 at a coupon rate of 5%. Company ABC agrees to pay the bondholder $50 per year until the maturity date of the bond. Assume that when the bond is issued that general interest rates are 5% and that the bond is a perpetuity bond, or perpetual bond, meaning that the bond has no maturity date. Most perpetual bonds are callable, meaning that the issuer of the bond retains the privilege, though not the obligation, 
to redeem or buy back the bond from the bondholder at a defined call price at some point in the future, usually not before five or ten years. Let's suppose that the market interest rates rise to 8%. How much would investors now be willing to pay for this same bond that returns $50 a year? If interest rates are now 8%, then other $1,000 bonds would now pay out $80 every year. Why would investors pay $1,000 for a similar bond that pays only $50 a year? The new price of the bond would now be less than $1,000 and is calculated using the yield formula where the yield equals the interest payment divided by the price of the bond. Rewritten, the price of the bond is calculated using the following equation. The price of the bond equals the interest payment divided by the yield. Previously, when market interest rates were 5%, the yield was equal to $50 divided by $1,000, which equaled 0.05. The interest payment has not changed and is equal to $50 a year. The yield is the current market interest rate, which is equal to 0.08. The new price of the bond equals $50 divided by 0 0.08, which equals $625. Notice that as interest rates rise, the price of a bond decreases, and as interest rates fall, the price of a bond increases. Stocks are different from most bonds. Instead of financing debt as in the case of bonds, stocks represent ownership or equity in a corporation and entitle owners to a share of profits called dividends paid out each year. Stocks are traded in stock exchanges, like the New York Stock Exchange. Now let's cover a few basics of personal finance. Most short-term loans are provided through credit cards, which typically have higher interest rates than most other forms of credit. Some credit cards offer teaser rates, an interest rate that initially starts low to encourage new customers, and then increases considerably in the hopes of charging high interest rates on large balances. To avoid high credit card debt and large interest payments, it is generally advisable to keep credit balances to a minimum, at least below 30% utilization, to choose lower cost borrowing options when they're available, to avoid applying for too many credit cards, to avoid racking up fees, and because credit scores can be negatively affected by excessive credit applications, and to never miss a payment, no matter the amount. When borrowing or lending, it is important to consider the effect of compounding interest. Compounding means that interest is charged on top of interest. For example, $1,000 of debt at an annually compounding interest rate will result in total debt of $1,100 at year one, at $1,210 at year two, at $1,331 at year three, and so on. Notice that the amount of interest added to the principal grows exponentially each year. First, $100, then $110, then 121, and so on. After 30 years, the total amount of debt would be $17,449. Compounding interest can powerfully increase your savings as a lender or powerfully increase your debt as a borrower. Now let's discuss several retirement savings plans. Participating in company retirement plans can lead to a more comfortable future. Most company retirement savings programs allow or perhaps require employees to contribute a certain percentage of their wage earnings into a retirement account. Many employers will offer partial, full, or sometimes exceed full matching. In many cases, an employee must satisfy the vesting period in order to keep the amount of employer retirement contributions. The vesting period is a minimum number of years a worker must be employed before the company's contribution to a retirement account becomes permanent. A 401k is tax deferred, meaning that an employee does not pay income tax on the contributed amount until the money is eventually withdrawn. The minimum age for withdrawing from a 401k is 59 and a half years. Early withdrawal comes with a 10% early withdrawal fee. Other retirement savings tools include Social Security, pensions, and IRAs. Social Security is a government-mandated retirement program funded through the payroll tax, FICA, which is 12.4% of income. 6.2% of that is paid by employees, and the other 6.2% is paid by employers. And this tax is imposed on incomes up to an annual gross income of $132,900 as of 2019. The minimum age for collecting Social Security is 62 years old. Pensions are an alternative to 401k type accounts. Pensions are monthly payments made by an employer from the day you retire until the day you die, based on the number of years you worked for the company and the salary that you earned. 
In addition to 401ks, Social Security, and pension plans, many individuals also choose to save using Individual Retirement Arrangements, or IRAs. Traditional IRAs allow one to save tax-deferred dollars up to a certain limit. Roth IRAs allow post-tax dollars to be saved and do not incur any taxes upon withdrawal after age 59 and a half, and contributions, not the interest earned, can be withdrawn without penalty. This wraps up our discussion of savings, investment, and the financial system. In the next lecture, we will discuss the Federal Reserve and the way that money is created in a fractional reserve banking system.